I'd like to stay here longer than man's allotted days and watch the fleeting changes of life's uneven ways. But if my Savior calls me to that sweet home on high, I'll live with him forever in glory. Turning, if you will, this morning to Colossians chapter 3. Again, that is Colossians, the third chapter. Truly, we're thankful to the God of heaven for your being here this morning. Uh, if this is your first time being with us, we're just doubly honored and appreciative uh, for you to be with us in our worship assembly this morning. The book of Colossians is a very uh, unique book in its nature. And the reason for that is, uh, the context of this book, we find two prominent doctrines going on during this time in their history. If you remember the book also, if you remember the book lets us know about this idea of uh, the Colossian heresy. Now, many like to speculate as to what the Colossian heresy was, but the Apostle Paul, what he does in this book is Paul basically just lets us know that it was in opposition to the doctrine of Christ. And we also read secondly about this idea of Gnosticism as well. If you remember, these Gnostics believe in their mind that they had this a secret knowledge, that they had this secret ability that the others around them were not afforded the opportunity to possess. But the thing about Gnosticism is in its very doctrine, it goes against everything Christ stands for. Gnosticism or Gnostics refuse to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Basically what the Gnostics say is, especially when you look at all the religious uh, institutions today, that being the Muslims especially, they have this idea in their mind that Jesus is just one of many gods. He's not the son of God. He's just one of the many gods, such as Dagon, such as uh, Epaphrodite, all the different gods we read about today. And so in Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 12, Paul there talks about being buried with him in baptism. So Paul here in Colossians chapter 3, he's setting the stage of what it is he want to talk about. And what we want to talk about this morning, this idea of putting on the new man. I love what Paul does in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we'll get to that later. In that particular chapter there, what Paul does here is he compares being reconciled to God as to putting on the new man. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, he is a new creation. And we'll certainly get to that towards the end of the sermon before this morning. So again, the Bible here lets us know in Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 12, Paul there again, he talks about this idea of being baptized. He talks about this idea of putting on the new man. He talks about this idea that he also mentioned in Romans chapter 6 verse 3 and 4 about being planted, being buried with him in baptism. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 9, I believe this is probably one of the most key verses in all of the text here. Paul says, in him, that being Jesus, dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And so what Paul does here in this particular chapter, again, they have this idea in their mind. Jesus is just one of many gods. Jesus is really not the son of God. Jesus is just a man just like you are, just like I am today. But Paul here says in that particular chapter, Colossians chapter 2, you have to beware of false doctrine. You have to beware of false teachings. Now, the next question should be, how do we know what false teaching is? Well, the Bible is going to tell us what the true doctrine of Christ is. And so by implication, if I know what the doctrine of Christ is, if I know what the Bible has to say in regards to my salvation, when I hear something and I know it goes against the word of God, I can rationalize that as what? Being false doctrine. But if I don't know the word of God, if I don't study the word of God, if I don't cling to the word of God, if I don't heed to the word of God, then when false doctrine comes in, I have no idea what's going on. I have no idea what to believe. And so Paul says this Colossian heresy is going on. Paul says this Gnosticism is going on. Paul says all these different doctrines are going on. And Paul basically says, don't let any man trick you. Paul says, don't let any man deceive you. 
If you remember 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 1, Paul there says, I, uh, Paul there, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and verse number 2, he says, Preach the word, be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Then he says, For the time will come. I don't think I can say this morning, the time has come. Paul says, For the time will come, but they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust, after their own desires, shall they eat to themselves, teachers having engineers, they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and they shall be turned unto fables. Paul says, You have to watch out for false doctrine. Paul says you have to, first of all, know what the Bible has to say. Paul says you need to be able to defend, 1 Peter 3, verse 15, what the Bible has to say. But not only that, Paul says you have to live what the Bible has to say. It's not enough just to know the Word of God, church. It's not enough just to read the Bible and expect the Bible to get into you. But you know what? You also have to be willing to get into the Bible as well. It's not enough just to read the Bible. It's not enough just to study the Bible, but you also have to be willing to make application from the messages you have heard in your own life. Paul says, when you put on the new man, Paul says, when you identify yourself as being a child of God, Paul says, there should be some changes that should take place in your life. Paul says, the way you used to act, Paul says you should just let that man die. Verse, verse number 5, Colossians 3. Paul there says, the New King James Version here says, verse number 5, therefore put to death. King James Version says, Paul says, mortify. Paul says, just let that stuff die. But what else does Paul say in this context about putting on the new man? Paul says in Colossians 3 and verse number 1, Paul says, If ye then be risen with Christ or raised with Christ, Paul says, Seek those things which are above with Christ sitting at the right hand of God. I want to more or less go through this verse backwards. Paul says here, first of all, Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Now, I really wanted to understand why did Paul put that phrase there? He's sitting at the right hand of God. I believe Paul put that phrase there because he wanted the brethren at Colossae to know that Jesus, he is the Son of God. The only person who's sitting next to, to God the Father is his son. Colossians 1 verse 3, he's at the right hand of God. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse number 3, he's at the right hand of God. Hebrews chapter 12, 1 through 4, he's at the right hand of God. The Bible constantly affirms the belief that we know to be true. That Jesus is at the right hand of God. Jesus is our mediator. Hebrews 4 verse 15. 1 John 2 1 and 2. And he is what? He is petitioning. He is our lawyer to the God the Father in heaven. Again, Paul says, if you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Again, Paul here is, again, letting them know the importance of because you have been baptized, he now gives you your aim. It would be one thing if we were converted and we have no idea what our mission was. More or less, we may speculate. More or less, we may say, you know what, God, you really didn't tell me what I had to do, what I had to do. But the Bible doesn't do that. Paul says, if you have been baptized, if you have been risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Well, the Bible also lets us know in Matthew 6, verse 33, seek God's kingdom first. And all these things shall be added unto you. So in multiple sections of the New Testament, the writers here are saying the very same thing. You have to see Christ first. You have to look or you have to, as the Bible says here in Colossians 1 and verse number 3, Paul says, for you have died and your life is hidden. The word hidden there in the original language carries the idea of being concealed. I'm being entrusted. I'm giving myself or I'm hiding myself in God's hand. Now, Paul here again talks about hiding ourselves in God. Molding our images after the likeness of God. Now again, if I'm not seeking those things which are above where Christ sits, then the implication next is, what am I doing? I'm molding myself and I'm molding my life after the world. But we shouldn't do that, should we? Absolutely not, because according to Romans 12, 1 and 2, what does Paul there say? Paul says, I beg you or I urge you, brethren, 
that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Paul says, which is your reasonable service. Then he says in verse 2, be not conformed to the world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Paul says in multiple sections of the New Testament, you have to mold your life after Christ. You have to be willing to put on the new man. But I've come to realize when I read the Bible from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, verse 21, all of us come to realize when we study our Bibles, a lot of people refuse or it's difficult for them to let that old man go. If you remember over in Exodus chapter 14, when God's people were going through the Red Sea, here you have water in front of them. Pharaoh's army is behind them. What are God's people going to do? What did Moses say? Moses said, well, let's stand still and let's wait on God. Exodus chapter 14, verse 15 and 16, God tells Moses, I don't know why you're waiting on me. I've already led you out here. All you have to do is go for it. So the Bible says here, the Red Sea opens up and God's children, they just walk in on dry ground. And Paul lets us know in 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 4, Paul lets us know how they were baptized under Moses, how they were baptized under the clouds, how they were baptized under the sea. And the Bible says as they get to Exodus chapter 15, what do they do? They are singing this praise. They're singing the song about Moses and the Lamb. They are just glorifying and they are just praising God. And so Moses says here, hey, because you all have been baptized, because you all have now went forward, Paul, uh, 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 Moses says, there now should be some changed behavior. Well, we all know the Bible, don't we? In Exodus chapter 16, when God's people had just got done rejoicing and thanking and praising God, the Bible says in Exodus chapter 16, those first three verses, God's people began to murmur and complain against God. Well, you know what, Moses, you, you should have just left us in Egypt. You should have just left us what Moses, we, we, we could have died in Egypt versus coming out here to die. We, we knew exactly where our food was going to come from. We knew exactly where we were going to lay our heads. We knew exactly what Pharaoh was and was not going to allow us to do. The children of Israel had their daily schedule already planned out. It was difficult for them to let go of what they knew. It was difficult for them to let go of what they were accustomed to. But I find it amazing that when you think about that Exodus account, God was the one who allowed them to go forward. God was the one who allowed them to put on the new man. God was the one who allowed them to make their way towards Canaan land. God was the one who gave them manna from heaven. God was the one who gave them water out of the rock. Do you catch that? God was the one who gave them all of that. If they go back, God is not going to stop them. But if they go back, they are going without God. When you go back to that old man, when you go back to that man you should have buried a long time ago, you're not going with the help of God. You're going by yourself. Paul says the new man, you have to be willing to put that on. Paul says the old man, you have to be willing to leave him where he is. Paul says again in verse chapter, chapter 3 and verse number 1, If you be raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Then he says here, set your affections. Set your mind on things above, not on things of this world, not on things of the earth. If I set my mind and my affections on heaven, that really doesn't leave a lot of room for me to be worried about everything here on earth. Now, that's not in any way saying I should just walk around living reckless. God gave me common sense. God gave me a mind. I have to take care of myself. I have to keep myself safe. I have to keep you safe. God gave us a mind to do all those things. But he also said on top of that, you shouldn't allow the things of this world 
to arrest your faith. You shouldn't allow the things of this world to cause you to want to take off the new man. All of us, we work hard so we can buy new things. So we can buy new clothes, new cars, new homes. What if someone told you you have to go back where you came from? We wouldn't like that because we have worked hard to get to where we are. We have worked hard to drive that car or to live in that house. We work hard for all those things. Paul basically says, what if someone came into your home and told you, you have to give all this up and you have to go back to where you started from? Many of us will politely ask that person to get out. You got to get out of my house. But Paul says, see, when you try to go back to that old man, Paul says you have put in all this work. Paul says you have put in all this energy. Paul says you have put in all this effort to get to where you are. Paul says if you go back, Moses says if you go back, you're going by yourself. Many use the verse, God is the God of yesterday, today, forever. I appreciate that and I understand that, but you know what? God don't want us to go back. If you remember a couple weeks ago from Exodus chapter 14, Moses said, let's stand still and let's wait on God. Let's just, let's just see what God's going to do. God said, Moses, I've already told you what to do. I want you to go forward. I want you to put on the new man. I want you to let the old man die. I want you to let that Egypt mentality die. But some of us, we like Egypt. Some of us like that old man because you know what? It takes a lot of effort for me not to tell you how I feel when you make me mad. That old man don't mind telling you how he feels. That old man don't mind telling you what's on his mind. But the new man, the new Josh Cantrell, I'm not going to do that. Because Paul says I have to let the old man die. Paul says here in Colossians 3 and verse number 5, Paul says, therefore, put to death. King James Version says, mortify, just let those things die. Then Paul here gives us some examples of what it is you want to talk about. Now, for the sake of time, we don't want to go through all those examples. But if you drop down here to verse number 12, Paul here talks about what we should be willing to put on. Paul says here in verse number 12, therefore, as the elect of God... Holy and beloved. God wants his people to live a holy and a beloved life. If you remember in 1 Peter 1 verse 16, Peter said, Be ye holy, for I am holy. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, softness our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus called to be saints. God has sanctified us and God has called us to be saints. Ephesians 4, beginning with verse number 1. I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you are worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called with all lowliness, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. Paul says in the bond of peace. Paul says here in verse number 12 again, therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved. Paul says, man, put on tender mercies. Yes. Paul says, put on kindness. If it's one thing all the world needs more of today, man, it is kindness. Paul said, put on kindness. Paul said, put on humility. Paul said, put on meekness. Paul said, put on long suffering. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Paul says the new man won't allow you to hold a grudge. Paul said the new man won't allow you to walk around and not speak to someone who has done you wrong. Paul says the new man won't allow you to think the same way you used to think. Paul says because you are that new man, Paul says everything you do has to be different. Now, I'm not saying in any way this morning am I saying this is an easy thing to do. I'm not in any way saying this morning once you are baptized, the temper you have is going to just go away. But what I am saying is you have to be willing to work on it. 
And most people, as the children of Israel, most folks are not willing to put in the work for God so he can work on them. Because when I put in the work with my Bible, if I not just allow the Bible to be preached to me or, or me reading the Bible, but when I begin making some application, what is that doing? It is shaping me into being that new man that the Bible just encourages for me to be. Because what happens when we put on the new man? When we put on the new man, the same stuff that used to get us upset just rolls off our shoulder now. The same words we used to say, we don't even think about those words anymore. The same temper we used to have, it may still be there, but you know what? It's not as bad as it used to be. And the point there is, every quality the Apostle Paul is giving us is an attribute of our Lord. Paul is telling us to put on everything that Jesus already is. Because when I put on my Lord, when I put on my Christian armor, when I try to mold my life after that of my Lord, I begin looking like a brand new person. Last of this morning, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 really quickly. Again, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 here, Paul compares being a new man to being reconciled back to God. Now, we know in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10, Paul says, every man must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. He goes on to say here in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse number 16. 17, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Verse 18 says, now... All things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through his son and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God which is in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses and have committed us to the word of reconciliation. Putting on the new man it reminds me of where I came from. It reminds me what God has done. And it reminds me of where I am going. I'm being reconciled back to God because of my sins. I'm being reconciled back to God because of the evil that I have done. If you remember the book of Romans, that's Paul's major thing. Is God's righteousness man's justification. How can a man be found justified before the God of heaven that is made possible by the righteousness of God? God, his attribute is righteous, absolutely, but that's not what we're talking about. Paul is talking about the way in which God brings a man into right standings with himself. How does God do that? How does God allow me to tap into the new person that he wants me to be? Therein lies the gospel. The good news that Jesus came, he lived, he died, but he also rose again. You know what those Gnostics teach? He really did die. In fact, one, when I was studying this past week, one a writer says, speaking of Gnosticism, Jesus really didn't die. He just went on a vacation and someone else went into the tomb. I said, man, the, the, the lengths people are willing to go to discredit our Lord and him raising from the dead. The same body that he died in was the same body he resurrected in. Yes. The same body they put in the tomb was the same body that came out. The same body that had his nails and piercings all in him, the same body they put the crown of thorns on his head is the same body he walked out. And I can hear Peter in Acts chapter 2 saying it was not possible for him to be holding out. Jesus said, I'll be leaving now because I have all power in my hands. The new man is what God wants us to be. The old man is what he wants us to let go of. How do we let go of of the old man. Again, we may have been that old man for 30, 36, 37 years. How can God expect me to get rid of that old man I've been for 36 years and become a new man that I've just learned about today? We do that with the Word of God. 
The Word of God is not just some old book that we put on the shelf and we just leave there. It's not what the Bible is. The Bible is God's inspired word to man, whereby we know how we can be saved from our sins. Paul says in 1 Timothy 4 and verse number 12, For I know whom I have believed in, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. If you're not a child of God this morning, we encourage you to put on the new man. This morning, you can let the old man die in the watery grave of baptism. You can come up a brand new person, a brand new creation, and you can begin the process of working on that new man that God wants you to be. Paul said in Romans 10, 17, faith coming by here, we can hear it by the word of God. Without faith, it's impossible to please him, willing to confess him as Lord, repent of your sins, and being baptized. What happens? As you go up, the old man stays down. Let's leave him where he is. If you're not a child of God this morning, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing. When we walk with the Lord in the light of